Hello, I'm sitting here today with author and comedian Sarah Benincasa. Sarah just recently wrote this book, Agora Fabulous, Dispatches from My Bedroom, and she's here to talk about it with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for I having me. I appreciate it. So Sarah, what was it like writing your first book? It was stressful, it was exciting, it was really depressing because my book is about, it's funny, but it's about some sad stuff. So writing my first book was um, an interesting way to relive pe a period in my life that was kind of crazy. So it was a lot of things. Mostly getting it done was a huge relief. I can imagine. Um, now I read the book and I really felt like I re could relate to your character, um, but for those in the audience that don't know, what's your book about? Well, uh, Agora Fabulous is about a gal, me, who uh, deals with agoraphobia, which is a fear of travel and open spaces. And um, so it's about one woman's struggle to uh, to deal with just you know a mental illness that's can be pretty intense and pretty debilitating. And I also deal with panic attacks and depression in the book. And um, so it, it's particularly good, I think, for young women or for anyone who has a person in his or her life who deals with anxiety or depression. I think it's very helpful. It's kind of like a cheat sheet to what it's like for someone who's going through that. So you want to know why I have panic attacks and why I just can't snap out of it. Let me tell you why I can't just snap out of it. Yeah, definitely. I felt as if, you know, hey, maybe I'm not crazy. Other people are going through the same things I am. So I appreciate you sharing your story with us. Oh, you are very welcome. <laughs> that was the whole point, because when I was really going through the hardest stuff that I dealt with, which was when I was 21, which was, you know, a year ago, <laughs> uh, which was 10 years ago. Um, what comforted me the most was reading books by people who had gone through what I was going through because if they had gotten through it and gotten better that meant that I could too. So that's really why I wrote the book and also because I wanted money. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it like living with a disease like agoraphobia? It's Oh, it's exciting. You get to really know your house. You get to really know the different corners of your house. Um, you watch a lot of television. Uh, you, unless you become afraid of the television, which I eventually became. Um, I, I, you know, for me, it was sort of like literally painting myself into a corner because at first I could move around my apartment and then I could only go in certain parts of my apartment. And then finally I was really restricted to my bed and if I needed to, you know, say go to the bathroom, um, on the occasion that I chose to actually like leave my room to do that like a normal person, I would just dash out and then dash back. But it, it's, it, it's obviously a really limiting life, but if you get the right help, you can get past it and lead this wonderful existence. Like, I love Paula Deen yes. <laughs> because, I, her, because A, she puts butter on everything, but yeah. B, she was agoraphobic and she suffered for 20 years with it. And because she was able to get the right kind of help, now she leads this incredibly full life and is making sweet bank. Like, if I could make some Paula Deen dollars, I would be happy as a clam. So it is something that can be overcome, but dealing with it is pretty tough. Yeah. Um, now I know you said in your book um, you had this big panic attack when you were 16 and you're out on vacation with uh, some of your fellow high schoolers. Was that the moment that catalyzed you realizing, hey, there's something wrong? Or were there moments earlier in your life where you realized, something's up, you know, I'm a little anxious? There were problems starting from when I was a child, you know, starting from when I was really little. Um, that I had this degree of anxiety over life in general that was a bit out of place for a kid. And um, I developed specific fears of traveling very early on. So trains scared me, cars scared me, airplanes scared me. Starting when I was pretty small, I'd say I was under 10. And so, you know, my parents chalked it up to one thing or another, a nervous temperament or uh, maybe maybe a learned behavior because of stress among the family regarding traveling on a particular trip. Oh, she's just acting this way because, you know, we had an argument before we left the house, something like that. Um, and, uh, and it just evolved from there. I think I probably had my first panic attack when I was 10, but I wasn't diagnosed until I was 16. And I didn't get on the right kind of medication and get the right treatment until I was 21. So it was, um, it was quite an adventure. 
I could imagine. Um, so how did you let your family know that you were dealing with this, especially at such a young age of being unsure of yourself? I think I acted out. I think a lot of times kids who are dealing with mental illness who don't have the words for it will act out in specific ways that, that may come off as bratty or just, and not to say that I wasn't a brat because I was, <laughs> but um, you know, just refusing to do things, seeming obstinate, seeming whiny, seeming really stubborn, where actually what's behind that stubbornness is fear. and. So I acted out in a lot of ways that um, I think covered up what was really going on. And I don't think that my parents had the education at the time, nor did I, to be able to identify what it was and really deal with it head on. I think now it would have been identified a lot earlier and dealt with a lot earlier. But um, it took a while. Yeah, we do hear um, in the news a lot more cases about anxiety and stress, especially with this economy and everything that's going on in the world right now. I'm, I'm sure people are, you know, freaking out a little bit, so I can understand that. Oh, sure, and I think that there's also, the field of child psychology has grown so much since I was a little kid. And, you know, sometimes what that leads to in child psychiatry as well, what that leads to is a certain incidence of, of over-medicating. But I think in my case, I, I was one of those kids who really could have used a hearty dose of Prozac <laughs> or something similar at a young age. I think I really would have benefited from it. That's good to hear because a lot of times we hear not so great things about the pharmaceutical industry. So knowing that something like that can really help a person uh, gives oh, people yeah. hope out there. Oh yeah, I think I would have been one of those kids who, uh, I mean, I think it would have been transformative for me. That said, I probably wouldn't have had some of the experiences that went into the book if I had been properly medicated. <laughs> so I wouldn't have written as entertaining a book. <laughs> so I guess it's a good thing. Everything happens for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Now I do have here a quote from your book. Um, you said, if his death taught me anything, it's that when life doesn't hand us the punishment we think we deserve, we are wholly adept at delivering it unto ourselves. What did you feel like you deserved to be punished for? I think I felt as if I were weak. Um, uh, I was writing in that it's specifically with regard to a friend of mine who committed suicide when we were 18 years old. And it was a very violent death. It was a very um, self-punishing death. It was not, it was very clear that he wanted to suffer in, in the end. And I'm not sure what he, what perceived sins he committed in his life that you know he thought he needed to punish himself for. But for me, when I became suicidal eventually in my early 20s, um, it was the desire for suicide was a desire for relief, but it was also a desire to uh, eliminate something that was imperfect from the world, that something being me. So it was this desire to eliminate something that was less than, something that was subpar and that was not, I didn't think that I was performing up to snuff as a human being. And so, so I thought, you know, maybe it was time to check out because of that. Yeah. Did, did you find it hard sharing all these feelings and thoughts with the rest of the world through your book? You know, I, it's been an interesting experience because I've, I did a, a live show called Agora Fabulous, which it, the book was based on, and I did that show in, gosh, I think something like 10 cities, including Oslo and Norway and, and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago and all over the place. So uh, the way that I wrote the book initially was writing it on stage, sort of just telling stories. And I think that experience and having people come up to me afterwards and speak with me, that really prepared me for what would happen when the book came out. And I also travel pretty frequently to speak to colleges, which I love. That's actually my favorite thing to do, is to travel and talk to college kids. I'll come in and, and talk about health and wellness. I'll talk about taking care of yourself mentally as well as physically. And I'll talk about just trying to break down stereotypes and break down fear for them about you know going to their counseling center. And that also prepared me well because kids are so, even at that age, they're grown-ups, you know, 18 to 22, they're adults, but they're still adolescents at the same time. So there's an openness that they have to talking about their problems with a stranger, me, that I think a lot of adults don't. So all of those experiences, talking about my life in front of crowds, really helped prepare me for dealing with 
you know, the feedback that I would get. Even reviews, honestly. <laughs> it even helped prepare me for getting reviews because not everyone who reads, who sees the material or hears it or reads it is going to like it. Um, and I already knew that because I had already gotten reviews for my show. So it really was a nice preparation. I would suggest to any author who has the need to get on stage, <laughs> um, it's a nice preparation to work your material out before writing it down. So you start out this book um, telling us that you have agoraphobia and you end the book with you becoming a stand-up comedian. How did that transition happen? Oh, through a lot of happy accidents and weird twists and turns, I, I became a stand-up comic. I eventually, you know, was able to deal with my agoraphobia. I never say that I'm cured of it because it's still hard to get to get out of bed some days and to, to leave the house. I mean, today was an example, but I'm here. Um, but I, so I can't say that I'm cured of it, but I manage it. So um, at, after you know some events recounted in the book, I was able to better manage my agoraphobia and panic attacks and depression, kind of get on the right path. And after I had been feeling pretty comfortable in my own skin for a few years, I decided that I wanted to go to graduate school at Teachers College at Columbia in New York. And so I moved to New York to go to school, which was a huge deal because I used to be very afraid of New York and Philadelphia and Boston and all major cities really. And, um, but I really thrived there and I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the city, but, and I enjoyed my classes, but I, I felt like there was something missing. Like maybe I wasn't supposed to be a high school teacher. That's what I was going to grad school for. But I didn't know what exactly. And then I had a friend in one of my grad school classes who had just quit her job at Comedy Central in the talent department there. And she said, you're really funny in class. Have you ever tried stand-up? And I said, no, I don't, like, what, what does that entail? And she explained it to me and introduced me to people from work and introduced me to different comics and sort of told me about how to get started. And so I got started then. And that's how I fell into stand-up. And then I just started working different jobs to support the stand-up, you know, until a time when I was able to start making money off entertainment and writing um, in the way that I wanted to. Terrific. Um, well, thank you for coming here today. And I'm glad your friend convinced you uh, to become a stand-up comedian. Um, I do have one last question for you. If you could give advice to anybody out there who is suffering from a uh, similar disease as you, what, what would you say? Oh, I would say get thee to a psychologist slash psychiatrist ASAP. And if you're too frightened to leave the house to do that, um, I would talk to your local hospital or your, especially if it's a university affiliated hospital, um, ask if they have anyone who is willing to make a house call and ask if they have anyone who specializes in anxiety disorders. At the very, very least, start doing phone sessions. And you can get better. You really, really can. Even if you haven't left your house in 20 years, you can be Paula Deen and you can leave your house and then get super rich and make Krispy Kreme donut pies <laughs> every day of your life, which is what I'm still working up to. So you can get better, you just have to try. You have to participate in your own recovery. Well, I want to thank Sarah so much for being with us here today and speaking about her book, Agora Fabulous Dispatches from My Bedroom. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you.